So here we have Jan that will speak us about simplified scalable graph analysis via domain specific language. So I hope you guys like it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan van der Lucht. Uh, I'm uh, a member of technical staff at Oracle Labs. I'm going to talk to you about uh, scalable graph analysis using our domain specific language Green Marl. Uh, there is some previous work for this, which I will not really talk about. We, um, we have developed a, a domain-specific language that allows you to write uh, graph algorithms in a very intuitive language um, with all kinds of nice constructs that are, are useful when you're writing a graph algorithm. And together with that, we wrote a compiler that compiles these programs into, um, well, first only uh, shared memory code, so that's C++ OpenMP. What I will talk to you about today is um, a second backend that will compile th the same programs to distributed backends. So in this case, um, Giraffe GPS. So yes. So the the nice thing of uh, having a DSL is that it's very intuitive. Uh, you don't have all, all kinds of boilerplate code that you have to write and all the the mechanical stuff that you would have to write every time. You can just uh, the compiler will write all that for you. And because it's written in a DSL at a very high level, the compiler can reason about on, on a high level. So it can all do all kinds of optimizations that you would not be able to do if you, if you wrote your program directly in Java or C++ or anything. And the result is that it's fair, it, it, it uh, generates very efficient code, with it, which is as efficient as hand-tuned code. But the problem with a uh, shared memory machine usually would uh, is, is that it doesn't have enough memory. Uh, unless you have a really big cluster, uh, a really big shared memory machine like the Cray machines, you, you run out of memory for reasonably large graphs. So how do we solve this? Well, we could use a disk-based system or SSDs, but there are so many random accesses all the time, the disk latency, even if it's an uh, SSD, will just kill you. So we could go distributed, but we don't want to write a, a standalone distributed program because it's a lot of work and will cost a lot. We could use MapReduce, uh, probably you're all familiar with MapReduce, um, but the problem with MapReduce is that it's not able to keep states across iterations, so it's, it's uh, very inefficient for graphs because you write to the DFS and you read back, so <coughs> what we need is a distributed runtime framework tailored for graph analysis, and luckily that was introduced a few years ago by Google, uh, it's called Prego, it's a distributed graph analysis, fr uh, graph processing framework. And what it is, basically, it's MapReduce, kind of MapReduce uh, style programming with uh, added to that uh, local states. And it, uh, it, it has bulk synchronous iterations. So the, the computation is split into steps, uh, super steps, they're called. And uh, they're bulk synchronous. So everything you do in uh, super step n arrives in stu super step n plus one. And that uh, has a few uh, advantages as we will see. So the API for uh, this, this system is uh, very simple. There's one function for the vertex, which is, well, you do a local computation. You can send messages to other vertices. Um, and the next se step they arrive, and then in the next step, you can receive those messages. And basically, you have three calls. Those are the, the core message calls that, that you can use. It's a very simple programming model. So the, the advantages are that it's uh, because you have this box synchronicity, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very efficient uh, in overlapping communication and computation. And you can, you can chunk all those messages together. So you can use your bandwidth better because you have less overhead which makes it very scalable. But there's a very big disadvantage of this, and that's the programming model I just introduced. Because it's vertex-centric, it's uh, bulk synchronous, and it's mes message passing, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to write uh, traditional graph, um, uh, graph algorithms in, in this, this paradigm. So normally you'd have a, a paper with some, some pseudocode description of an algorithm, and that's, that completely doesn't look like uh, the code that you see, uh, uh, that, that, that doesn't look like the code that uh, you use for Giraffe. So we programmers should fill this gap and we should convert these uh, pseudocodes to 
uh, Prego programs. Let me give you an example for this. For example, in a social network, you want to know the average number of teenage followers of the people who themselves are older than K years, otherwise known as the how cool is your daddy query. So you could, uh, in a pseudocode-like fashion, this is actually a green moral code, uh, you would write it like this. So you have a for each loop over all the nodes. For every node, you initialize a variable called the teen count. And you count the uh, number of neighbors whose age is bigger or equal than 10 and smaller than 20. Then when all the uh, nodes have this variable initialized, you take the average for all the nodes that have an age bigger than k, you average their teen count and, count and you store that into another variable. And then you have the average age. So, okay, so this, this is, looks pretty simple. It's a very simple computation. But if you want to do this, oh, let me show you some characteristics. This is, here you read data, you read your neighbor's data, you uh, read this, uh, this node's data from a, a global, uh, global part of the computation. It's a global computation. But in uh, Prego, it, it, it would look like this. So you uh, have different steps. You have to partition it, or you have to uh, separate it into steps. You have to send messages to your neighbors. You have to receive those messages. You have uh, boilerplate code. You have to put everything in one function because there's only one function you can implement. So you, you, you kind of have to put everything in one function and then define the steps and then handle make sure that all the vertices are working on the same step. So you really have to change a lot. So message sending, receiving. And another thing, because it's message based, you can only send messages. So you can only push data to other nodes. You can't actually pull it from another node. So you have to reverse that process and, and rewrite the algorithm so it just pushes data, which makes it, uh, well, not very convenient. Uh, so our proposal was uh, let, a, let a compiler do this. So we uh, extended our compiler with a second backend. So you can not just generate C++ OpenMP code, but you can also create Prego code, um, which is message passing, box synchronous, and vertex centric. And of course, we don't have the real Prego, <coughs> so uh, we support the Prego paradigm with different backends. One of the, 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 the first uh, backend we supported was uh, Stanford GPS, which is a clone from uh, Stanford. Uh, it's very similar to Giraffe. Um, it has some nice properties, which we um, built into Giraffe as well. I'll come back to those later on. And then, of course, uh, the Giraffe, which is probably the most uh, used uh, Prego re-implementation. It's an uh, Apache project. So, of course, you, you, you cannot just simply convert one into another. It's, uh, as with every compilation, it's, there are a lot of prob uh, problems that you have to overcome in order to translate these programs. So, for example, you have um, sequential computation. So, you have uh, parts of your program that will be done for every vertex. But there are also some parts that are, have to be done uh, globally and sequential and, and not on all the vertices like the, the average that I just uh, created, that you don't want to do that for every node, you just want to do that once. And that goes, uh, kind of goes together with the globally scoped variables. There are some variables that you just want to have one copy of instead of a copy of at every node. Then you uh, have to make sure that all your data <laughs> reading and writing is done using messages. Uh, you have to make sure that if you have different steps that all the, uh, all the vertices are executing the same steps uh, at the same time, so you have to, to uh, coordinate that, and you have to rewrite your programs so they use uh, data pushing instead of data pulling. Of course, there are more problems, but let's not go into those uh, right away. So this is our example that I just uh, showed you with a function call around it, and the compiler will rewrite this into the following <coughs> program. It looks very difficult, but actually the only thing that happened is that the average was translated into a for each loop and the count up there is also uh, translated into a for each loop with the filters and everything <coughs> changed into an if statement. And what you can identify here is that there are global variables. 
here, and there is some sequential computation here. And also one of the function parameters is also a global <coughs> variable. Uh, well, luckily, Giraffe has, uh, since uh, about a few months ago, they have uh, an API to, uh, to do this. There's a master compute. So um, you would only, at first you would only have the, the vertex compute, so you could only execute stuff for the vertices. But you can, in your program, you can add a master class um, which then does the sequential global computation and you, it is alternated with the computation on the vertices, uh, vertices. So first all the vertices ex execute, then the master executes and then the vertex and they alternate until uh, either all the vertices or the master decides to, uh, to uh, shut down. And we also have aggregators to communicate with the master. So the master can put something in an aggregator and the vertex can read something from an aggregator. And these two things we will use uh, in our transformations. So we had the, the global variables. What the compiler does it, is it puts those global variables into the master class and it initializes them when necessary. And it does the same for the, for the uh, vertex uh, property. So you have the NP uh, variables there, which are um, variables that are bound to node properties. So this means that every node or every vertex in the graph has an integer called age and an uh, integer called teen, uh, teen count. And it puts those into the vertex class. So now we have two classes with the, the right vertices and the right number of copies of the variables. And then we have to decide how the execution will, will happen. We have the same program again, and the compiler will identify which blocks are, uh, have to be executed for every vertex and which have to be executed once. Well, it's really easy in this case because everything that has to be executed for every vertex is in a for each statement for every for all the nodes so those that's two uh, those two blocks and the other blocks have to be executed sequentially so initializing of some variables and a reduction of, of those uh, of those variables then it creates a state machine uh, based on those um, on those steps so it knows that first we have to initialize our program, then it have to, uh, we have to execute something for the, for the, the vertices and sequential part, and it connects all those steps together. And it puts uh, the state machine into the master compute. So it, it's basically one big switch statement with a state, and uh, the state, as you can see, is put in an aggregator and when the control is handed to the vertices, the vertices can read this aggregator and they know which state they have to execute. So uh, state one and two will, will be in the vertex and state zero, three and four will be in the master. Actually one and two will also be in the master but that will just contain a give control to the, the vertices. Then we have the communication that we need to take care of. So all the data reading and writing. Whenever you have a, a, a nested loop in your code, there's basically communication going on because uh, here for every node in the graph, you want to do something for all the neighbors. So uh, the, suppose you want to add a value to your neighbor's foo property, then you send them uh, your val and then the neighbor receives this message and adds it to its foo property. So that's very simple. All the n nodes, they send uh, values over to the t nodes and they add those values and they sum them up. Uh, what you do in a Pregel style program is you, uh, you split this. So there are two states. One of them is send the message and the other one is receive the message. So basically you, s you split the for each loops into two for each loops. But there's a problem. What if you want to read data from another node? So in this case, uh, how would you handle that? Um, for every node, you want to add 
a value from your neighbor. So you want to you want to get a value that's stored at your neighbor, and you want to pull it towards you and add it to your own property. So the only thing that we change here is the order of the of the nodes. So the source and the destination have been exchanged, and now we're suddenly we're reading, but like I said, we cannot read, we can only push data. So we have to translate this. And what we can do is we can uh, create, uh, based on the edges in the graph, we can create reverse edges. So whenever this is necessary, the, the compiler will uh, uh, implement code that, that does this, that will generate reverse edges. And using those reverse edges, we can have T send stuff again. So whenever T is pushing here <coughs> in the original graph, that was pulling data. So the compiler rewrites this, it flips T and N, and then uh, using the, the reverse edges, it will uh, mimic uh, pulling data. This is the edge flipping transformation. <laughs> so what this would look like in an ex example is you have uh, uh, your nodes, uh, which need to pull data. You uh, rewrite this into a for each statement. Here you see that you have the nested for each and you're pulling data. So that loop is split into two loops. Uh, here, so you split it into two loops. And then you apply the edge flipping. So this is our compl complete example with all the, transformation, uh, all the transformations uh, applied. So this, this, is, uh, well, we were, this is all done by the compiler, of course, so you don't have to worry about this. But we started with a very simple program, and we transformed our program into something that can be uh, applied on a prego like platform. So we create a state machine on this one, uh, based on this. And all those states are uh, are put in the state machine and then whenever and they're actually merged together again so you don't uh, uh, so you have less steps and if you execute this then basically everything that you uh, uh, all, all, all the transformations fall into place and everything executes and, and comes back together and, and you can just execute this on, the, on GPS or Giraffe. Um, we have a lot of future plans. Uh, right now there's a, a specific set of, uh, of uh, programs that we can uh, um, transform to Prego programs. We cannot yet uh, implement everything. So for example, breadth first search is, is pretty uh, difficult uh, to write in a Prego-like fashion. But we're working on that. Um, then you want to have something like common neighbors, but for common neighbors you want to uh, store collections on the on the <coughs> nodes uh, instead of just scalar properties. Uh, so those uh, collections are also very uh, are, are difficult to handle because you want to send in a message some property to another node that it has to add this to some collection, uh, but there's also some time between it. So you have to because it's in the next super step. So uh, it's it's pretty difficult to uh, um, get that all synchronized and make sure that everything is is sent and received at the, at the right time. Our idea is that everything that you can, uh, all the uh, transformations that you can do manually. So if if you have an algorithm and you can convert it into a Prego program manually, then it should be possible to do this via compiler, as long as the compiler has enough information. So that's what we are working on right now. To conclude, well, I showed you some things of Green Marl. All the benefits of Green Marl is that you have uh, a much higher productivity. Uh, you have still high performance code because you can run stuff distributedly. And your code is portable because you can <laughs> use the same program uh, to execute in shared memory mode and in distributed mode, which means you will only have to write your programs once. And then whenever your graph is small enough, you can uh, execute it on a single machine, and whenever you, it doesn't fit in memory anymore, you scale out to the distributed backend. That was my talk. Thank you.
more than enough time for questions. Yeah, we have 10 minutes for questions, yeah. And Oh, sorry, yes? <laughs> um, I'm very new to this uh, domain, so my yes. question may be very naive. Um, how do you handle the case where uh, g.node, so the, the collection of all the nodes, is difficult to handle in the memory of a single computer? Okay? So how do you handle the case where g.node should be sharded between different computers? Uh, that's, that's taken care of by the GRF or GPS, okay. by your Prego framework. So um, um, every every worker, every machine uh, has uh, is responsible for a part of your graph, and it it walks over the the, the vertices that it's responsible for, and it executes um, uh, the, the, the the vertex compute function for those vertices, and then w whenever it's done for all the when it's done for uh, the doing the computation for all the vertices. It hands control to the master, and then the master executes on one of the machines, and then it goes back to all the workers. See? So yes. Do you also take care of operations like uh, starting the, the cluster and controlling how it's run, or is that really up to the user and you just provide the uh, implementation? Uh, so, so the question was do we also handle starting the cluster and shutting it down, et cetera? Content, or can I generate programs that load data into the um, we we don't start and stop the cluster and stuff like that. Uh, mo most uh, use cases, uh, you have a, a cluster running, so uh, we assume that the cluster is running. We just generate uh, Java programs. What we do do uh, what we do, however, is um, uh, generate input and output uh, wrappers for you, so you don't have to um, generate those yourself. You you can just for some sim uh, sample formats like edge lists or adjacency <coughs> lists. We are also supporting uh, Evro right now. Uh, you, you can just read those and it maps directly onto your, um, onto your program as long as the names of the, um, uh, the names of the properties in your uh, Evro file are the same as the names in your green model program. It will, it will know and it will load them automatically in, into the right functions. Another question over there? Uh, yeah, uh, is it already possible to try it out? Or is it yeah. The question is, is it possible to try it out? Yes. Uh, I should have put a link on here. If you uh, Google Green Marl, okay. it's on GitHub. And then uh, you can try it out. You, you can uh, easily run uh, the, um, uh, the shared memory examples just on, on your local machine. And if you have a Hadoop <laughs> cluster, you can, uh, there's an example on the, on the, on the GitHub page. Where you, uh, that you can follow, and then you'll, it will generate Java files for you. You compile them into a jar, and <coughs> once you fire that to your Hadoop cluster, it will, right, it will know. So, I think it does everything until the jar creation of the jar file for you. Okay. okay? Uh, I have a question about the performance. Did you already try to evaluate your JRAF uh, implementation of your code? Yes. Uh, the question was, did we evaluate the JRAF, uh, <coughs> the the programs? I assume you mean uh, if it's comparable to hand-tuned code? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, we did that, and they're uh, pretty comparable. Uh, the only thing um, that we didn't do at the time of the evaluation is um, uh, message combiners. So in Giraffe, you can have message combiners. So if you uh, <laughs> send page rank values, which are all ints, you can, while they are being sent at, at a node, before you chunk messages together, you can combine those messages into one sum, so you have less data to transfer. Uh, that's, we don't do that yet, so that's, uh, that made it a little bit slower, but it's within a few percent of the runtime of hand-tuned code. Even though you have this state machine running in the back on the master, it adds very, very little overhead, so it's, it's almost as fast as hand-tuned code. If we add we, we, in theory, we could add those message combiners, then it would be <coughs> equally fast as a uh, as hand-tuned code. More questions in the back? How hard is it to uh, introduce a uh, transformer for, for a new framework like Signal Collect? Uh, probably with uh, Signal Collect. Uh, of course, this is the 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 issue with domain-specific languages. Once you have your 
um, compiler, you have, you have your domain specific language and you have your backends and it's very nice, but someone has to write the right backend and that person has to, has to have all the domain uh, specific knowledge. From what I've understood from uh, Signal Collect, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, com comparable, it's so, some, somewhat comparable to uh, Pregel, so you have data uh, pulling, no data reading, right? So all those transformations that you use here, uh, if I go back to uh, this code, this is all still green moral code. So this you can reuse this, and this maps way better onto Signal Collect than the first example does. So you can reuse it from here, and what you have to do is, is you have to transform this AST to a Signal Collect AST, and probably you can reuse a lot of uh, classes that are already in the compiler. But yeah, that's probably a few months of work in order to really use all the functionality that's in Signal Collect. So uh, I, I don't know about the GPS uh, one, but the Giraffe implementation was, uh, was a few months of work. One of the big uh, problems was that uh, we use uh, a master compute, so we need to have something for uh, globally <coughs> scoped uh, execution. And Giraffe didn't have that at the time, so I had to... There was a Jira open, so I <laughs> recreated the code for that Jira in order so that Giraffe would have a master compute so we could map our uh, code onto that ma master compute. So that's... Um, uh, that, that's what took the most time. And then mapping, because Giraffe and GPS are both Pregel re-implementation, only the, the final step uh, of the compiler had to be um, over overwritten where it emits the code because it, everything is uh, AST transformation, uh, transformations up until the final step where the AST is converted to code and only that step had to change because the, the, the paradigms of those two frameworks are almost completely the same. So that, that was actually pretty easy but we had to make Giraffe compatible kind of <laughs> first. No more questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.